It's a great pleasure to welcome to the stage Deepa Mehta. And now, as you can hear, she probably needs no introduction. Thanks. Uh, to you uh, because we have all enjoyed her films. She's a major figure in the Canadian film world. Uh, she is best described in one sentence as a transnational Oscar-nominated screenwriter and director whose work is known for its honesty, beauty, and universality. Her films include Fire, Earth, Water, and Heaven on Earth. And just as we were walking into the building, there was a... Uh, yes, that deserves an applause. And as we were walking in, there was a whiteboard, and Jeet noticed that it was something to do with a science class, and it had fire, water, earth, air, and space on it, so we thought that was a good omen. <laughs> Her latest film is, of course, an adaptation of Salman Rushdie's novel, Midnight's Children. Numerous awards include the Lifetime Artistic Achievement for the Governor General's Performing Arts Awards, Global Leadership Award from the International, International Film Awards, Outstanding Contribution to International and Local Cinema Award from the Toronto South Asian Film Festival, and uh, we also want to congratulate her on on her most recent recognition, the highest civilian award in Canada, the Order of Canada. So please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And now it's uh, an honor to welcome our next guest, uh, Mr. Jeet Thayal, who I had the pleasure of speaking with on North by Northwest this weekend. And he is an award-winning Indian poet, novelist, and musician. He was born in India, educated in Hong Kong, New York, and Mumbai. His first novel, Narcopolis, which I urge you to read, it's a, a very... A dreamy and fascinating, beautifully written look at uh, life in Bombay in the 1970s. It was shortlisted for the uh, 2012 Man Booker Prize. It won the DSC Prize for South Asian Literature, and it's currently shortlisted for the Commonwealth Book Prize. He also has written four collections of poetry that include uh, the, These Errors Are Correct and was awarded the Sahitya Academy Award for English in 2012. Uh, he has edited uh, anthologies, including the Blood Axe Book of Contemporary Indian Poets. He's part of a musical duo, uh, Sridhar and Thayel, whose debut album, STD, was uh, released last year. Uh, he's also written a libretto for uh, Babur in London. And you can see his musical side tonight at the closing party at the Lit and Sound Cabaret in, at Performance Works on Granville Island. But right now, that starts at 9 p.m. Do not miss it. But right now, please welcome Jeet Thayel. And finally, I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening, the artistic director and co-founder of this fabulous festival, Siresh Rao. He's an author who's written 20 books, including children's books, commentaries on street art and popular culture, retelling of Greek plays. He's won several international awards. He's been translated into 17 languages. And uh, he's also a publisher in a previous avatar and is deeply involved with the greatest literary show on earth, the Jaipur Festival, Literature Festival. Please welcome Siresh Rao. And I can feel the ideas percolating in the room, so I will leave the stage and allow it all to blossom. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Great. So welcome, everyone. I mean, I really shouldn't be here. Um, this was supposed to be a conversation between Deepa and Jeet, but they very sweetly and forcefully arm-twisted me, um, <laughs> saying that, oh, no, you know, be, you sit along and, you know, who, who can refuse the two of these, the very, very first years of... So, uh, no, it's really great that we're here talking about this. In a way, I just, if I do my job right, I'll recede into the background, and you won't hear much from me after this, and, and they'll get into a conversation. But really, this whole idea of hybridity rather than multiculturalism because somewhere multiculturalism assumes that these things don't cross-pollinate and mix. It's just many cultures. But we're interested in hybridity and what Pico Iyer dis described as the global soul. How do we, um, some of us who have these multiple heritages, influences, inspirations, work this through in life and work? And I must thank also, you know, Deepa's presence here is due to the suggestion of another hybrid soul, Vikram Vij. Um, so Vikram, of course, is very used to this sort of hybridity. And he, we were just talking about Jeet being here. And he said, Deepaji, Deepaji, you have to invite <laughs> Deepaji. And she was so generous. 
So thank you so much. No, no, my pleasure. So, I mean, uh, to kick it off, I should, the best thing is to be like Freud. <laughs> Tell us about your childhood. <laughs> <laughs> we only have an hour. Yeah, I know. <laughs> no, Jeet, no, you, why don't you start before we know it'll be yeah, over? No, Jeet, really, because I, <laughs> I, I, I know deep dark, I mean, if you want to go deep dark, that's fine. <laughs> but, but really, uh, what stuck in my mind in one of the conversations we had, uh, and you've said, uh, spoken about this before, is that moment when you were 13, 14, when your uncle, who has this bizarre museum to Baudelaire, yeah. introduced you to Baudelaire? I mean, that's like this, you know, reminds me of that Neruda poem, you know, I don't know when poetry first arrived in search of me. I don't mm -hmm. know where it came from. So let, let's hear about the Baudelaire Museum. Sure. Yeah. Well, it wasn't called the Baudelaire Museum. It <laughs> should have been. It was just a house in Cochin, of all places. Um, uh, and I think uh, to say he was obsessed mm -hmm. is to put it, is to understate it. He was um, more than obsessed. I think he was transported by the idea of Baudelaire because, uh, you know, Baudelaire was the, the, the original kind of uh, uh, epitome of the romantic, tortured poet with some tremendous psychic wound that, manifested itself in, in wonderful poems. And something about his life, his very short and tragic life, resonated with my uncle. And his entire house was a kind of a shrine wow. to Baudelaire. He had every book by Baudelaire, of course, but also every translation of Baudelaire and every critical work on Baudelaire. And he had portraits of Baudelaire at different stages of his this life. This is amazing. Oh. And, he was just, and he was translating Baudelaire into Malayalam, <laughs> of all things. I mean, if you can think of a more uh, you know, um, futile... Kind of, uh, just sweet and futile. But, and of course, you, know, you can't translate Fleur du Mal. It's never been translated by a single translator because mm. you need a, a small army to translate it. It's such a big book. And, of course, he never completed it. He wrote one book in his life. It's called Public Law, Some Aspects. <laughs> <laughs> he was a lawyer. Oh. <laughs> and he died uh, fairly young, died at, I think, uh, about 51 in London. He was there for a conference, died of a heart attack. But at 14, I, for some reason, he said I was his favorite nephew. I'm sure he said this to other nephews, but you know, he said I was his favorite nephew and introduced me to Baudelaire. The thing about Baudelaire is if somebody is your favorite nephew, you shouldn't introduce him to Baudelaire. <laughs> it's just not a good idea this is because it can ruin a young person's life. You know, as it did mine, I, I became a poet. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, and those lines? Yeah, yes. those lines. Yeah, yeah well, uh, the, he, he gave me a book uh, translated, uh, the Fleur du Mal translated by George Dillon and Edna St. Vincent Millay, um, uh, published in the mid, I think, around the uh, uh, late 1950s. And the first poem in the book was uh, called Le Lete, which is the mythical a river where you drink to forget, the river of forget forgetfulness. And the first, I read the first lines, and I remember my hair stood on end, and it, re I, it reminded me of something Emily Dickinson had said, which is that great poetry has a physical effect on you. And it certainly did. And I remember looking for this book for... when We used to go to Kerala for holidays every two years. And I remember looking for this book for two years. I never found it. And then when I returned to Kerala after two years, found the same book read the same poem, and exactly the same thing happened. And uh, the first lines were, uh, Come to my arms, cruel and sullen thing. Indolent beast, come to my arms again, for I would plunge my fingers in your mane and be a long time unremembering. Ooh, wow. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, your turn. Oh childhood. my God, so that's, that's a very hard <laughs> act to follow. <laughs> no. but, but, uh, I mean, you too, in a way, you know, I was trying to see it. When, when did film and when did poetry mm. enter each of your lives? And, and, and for you, um, I kind of 
feel there was a cinema paradiso like moment because your father was a distributor of films mm -hmm. and I'm you an grew up watching yeah. films. So tell us a little about that. Well, I, I grew up in a place called uh, Amritsar in, in India and Vikram and myself are proud to call it our home. It's, uh, it's a small city uh, which hosts, uh, the, which has the Golden Temple in it. But uh, my father was a film distributor and an exhibitor. So what happened after school was the best way to babysit us was to take us to the movie. And uh, that's where we'd end up, you know, with uh, everybody in tow. And, uh, and I saw my first film in Amritsar. And it was, a, it was a film called Mamta, which literally means motherhood. And it was very dramatic and great songs and, and lovely names and performances. And, I, and I remember feeling at that point that uh, I don't know what it is about what I'm seeing. It's so far away. It's on a screen. I can't smell it. I can't touch it. Why am I so moved? Uh, and, uh, and it was uh, my father actually took me to the projection room. I held a piece of celluloid. He walked me to the screen. He, you know, I got to touch it. And somewhere between the projection room and the screen, magic happened, and I mm. was sold. But more than anything, I think that we're talking about hybridity, and uh, was that on Sundays we used to have. Um, Sundays was the only day at 11 o'clock where we'd have what we called morning shows. You, sure. which, su yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is the only time we saw what we called white films. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and my first white film was um, Blue Hawaii. <laughs> and I'll never forget that. You know, it was Elvis Presley, and I said, Oh my God! You know, there's the guitar, and there's, you know, it's uh, there's the moon, and there's Elvis Presley, and I thought that was magic. Uh, so it's, it's a question of being exposed to, at a very early age to another world. So when I came to Canada, it sort of bewildered me that many people hadn't been exposed to my world. And I wondered why that was the case. And of course, when I grew older, it's, it's, sort of, it's a whole sort of colonial baggage that one carries. But uh, <laughs> I, I'm really happy that uh, we learned world history in my school. Uh, we were really exposed to other cultures. And, and Elvis Presley at the age of six, you know, so <laughs> he learned something. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean it's, it, it's funny for those of us who consider ourselves global souls. You never know what your inheritance is. You go through this uneasy relationship with your roots. Um, sometimes you run as far away as you can from mm -hmm. what you consider your roots because you're looking for something else, and then suddenly you come back to it somewhere and realize what your inheritance is mm -hmm. culturally. And one of those things that, that I know happened for you um, much later in, in your career is, is the Natya Shastras. And this is, um, this is a second century text on performance, but I was struck by what you have to say about that and how that sort of changed things for you. So, uh, Jeet, you know about the Natya Shastras? I'm sure you do. Not you enough. have to say you do. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm so hybrid, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> see, see what I have to deal with? I mean, God. <laughs> Kids these days. <laughs> yeah, really, can't take him anywhere. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, seriously, you know, I, I really believe in rehearsals before we start shooting, and I spend about a year, uh, you know, after a script is done, looking at it in different aspects, and... And then, before we start shooting, maybe a month of intense rehearsals. And, uh, and the way I'd been rehearsing for the longest time was sort of the Western sort of Stanislavski method of the method acting, you know, where uh, characters are called upon to go back to some kind of, be Freud, in fact, <laughs> and, uh, some psych psychological uh, uh, moment that they can relate to in their own lives to the character that they're playing. And, uh, you know, it, it's a very good method and et cetera. Or, but then I was, ex about, about four years ago, a friend of mine in India who's a wonderful theater director called Neelam Man Singh Chaudhary um, said, have you heard of the Natya Shastras? And I said, yes, I have. It's a, like Suresh said, it's a second century text on drama. And, uh, and it teaches, and it's, you know, like about more than a thousand pages long. And it, it explores every aspect of uh, dance, drama, music, and gives you tools on how each aspect 
of all of the perform performing arts can be dealt with. So, uh, you know, whether it's uh, music, and Ravi Shankar used it a lot in when he composed his music, and uh, many artists do as well. As, and uh, what, what struck me about the Natya Shastras is that it's all about emotion. So you, they, according to the Natya Shastras, there are nine human emotions, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, it's humor, love, hatred, uh, repulsion, wonderment, uh, silence, uh, bravery, humor, uh, and, uh, and peace is the main one. And some permutation and combination of all those emotions is what's, what a character in a film or in a play has to access. So for example, if I'm saying, if as a hero of a, of, or heroine of, uh, uh, of a film, I'm, I have to say, um, I love you. And you would never ever say it from the emotional center of just pure love. Because according to the Natya Shastras, there's no, they, all emotions are a permutation and combination of every aspect of those nine rasas. So what, what you do is you build up a really complex character. And what we did was uh, make a grid on the floor with the nine emotions. So every square uh, represented an emotion. And an actor would walk along all those nine emotions and I'd say, stop. And if she would find herself in the box of hatred, she had to say, I love you from the aspect of hatred. So what you really get to explore yourself as a human being. And my life got changed. And, and I must tell you, the, uh, one of the things that really got me about the Nartya Shastra is that there are great myths about how it originated you know, 5,000 years ago. And one of the myths that is the most popular and that I love is that uh, uh, Shiva, and, uh, who is the god of destruction, and Brahma, the creator in the Holy Trinity in Hinduism, and Vishnu, the preserver, was sort of hanging around because they'd created the world. And, and they were sort of saying, yeah, it's really a cool place. And, you know, everybody <laughs> looks really happy, and uh, there's, no, uh, there's no disease, there's no, uh, uh, you know, everybody's well fed. And, and, uh, and, you know, sort of Shiva, who's always sort of known as the shit disturber, said, uh, <laughs> said, oh, he said you know, yeah, everything <clears throat> is fine, but it's kind of boring. So Brahma was very offended by this. And he said, what do you mean the world that I've created can't be boring? He said, just look at everybody. They're doing their thing and they're happy, but they look unmotivated. So he said, yeah, you're, maybe you're right. So what do you think is lacking? And Shiva thought about it and he said, you know, entertainment. <laughs> and that's how the Natya Shastras were written. So I thought, what a great story <laughs> here <laughs> it is. <laughs> 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 Yeah, that's why I love the Natya Shastras. And I mean, speaking of entertainment and performance, Jeet is one such. And chatting before, Deepa wanted to ask you about your music. So you leave me out of it and sure. go for it. <laughs> but uh, isn't that uh, for theater, mainly? Mm -hmm. that they use? Yeah, but you know, the whole idea is that, you know, uh, drama, when I, I, I feel that any actor that I'd like to work with, if they have a background in theater, I'm blessed. Sure because the discipline that comes from theater about whether it's performance or whether it's even production design or it's the whole aspect of presentation really helps in cinema. And it makes, um, may, it gives you a kind of background that always comes in handy always. in front of a camera. And I think that, all, I think those nine emotions, the nine rasas as they're called, uh, are so, um, cover all aspects of what is possible. And is it, isn't it very different from the idea of method? It's totally different. Right. So, you know, it's, it's like sort of what you said earlier, that you're mm. embracing something that, that you... It, it never even struck me to access it. Mm. And I was so sort of caught in the Russian, the Stanislavski method of, of, of getting an actor to prepare uh, that I never looked at something that, that is so, you know, in my own sort of background and is mm. so rich in its... Um, in what it has to offer, but I'd, you know, I'd really, I'd, anybody who's interested in theatre, you know, you can you can get a copy of the Natya Shastras from Amazon.com or whatever, and mm -hmm. uh, and they're really good translations. And the one that's fabulous is one by Girish Karnad. Oh right, of course. 
Yeah. One of the great Indian uh, uh, playwright, scholars and playwrights. playwrights yeah. So we, we have to hear about music and oh, poetry yeah. and how did that happen? <laughs> well, I, you know, I, when you start uh, writing poetry or, or even writing fiction, you are never told at that stage that you're going to have to read in public. <laughs> this is a whole new thing. This is, you know, this is part of the the fest, the idea of literature as part of a literary festival, and this isn't how it used to be twenty or thirty years ago. You know, writers twenty or thirty years ago they wrote books. That's all they did, which is why V. S. Naipaul has written twenty five books. You know, he says if he had to prom- write a book and then spend a year or two promoting it, he wouldn't have written as many books as he's written. So, but but what happens when you read in public is it, you have to develop a, a whole other set of skills because it really is completely separate from from your real job which is to sit alone in a room and write mm-hmm. and you know sitting alone in a room and writing it's really there's nothing um, there's no worse torture honestly because <laughs> you know you're alone first of all in a room and that's it I mean <laughs> You know, it's what happens to people if you commit a terrible crime, right? <laughs> and it's called solitary. Yes. Solitary confinement. We do this to ourselves voluntarily, you know, day after day. For what earthly reason? I mean, you have to be a deeply damaged individual you know, to, to think there's some value in that kind of suffering, right? So, anyway, so that's a very solitary kind of occupation. And then you come into a room like this and you read your work to human beings you know and it's a uh, it's a whole other thing it's a very gratifying very it's it you know it's the opposite of the process of it mm-hmm. but it also requires a set of skills that you never signed up for mm-hmm. you know you have to learn theater skills, oh, totally. yeah. projection yeah. Mm-hmm. voice projection mm-hmm. you have to learn uh, about brevity, yeah. Brevity, you have to yeah, learn no, about... No, truly. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. <laughs> you have to learn about silence, <laughs> breathing, <laughs> timing. Breathing, <Yeah>. timing. <laughs> to the ninth emotion, yes. Yeah. Which is peace. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, so yeah. And Sorry. so, you know, mm. you develop those things on, on the road on the fly, if you're lucky. But I also think of some great poets I've known who are terrible readers. That's true. That really is. And that kills it somehow. Yeah. (laughs) No, I'm I'm serious. I I really, you know... Well, I've always gone to readings by poets I've loved, not to hear the poems, Mm -hmm. but to hear the mistakes. Uh, Yeah. And, you know, to see the little... The screw ups, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The socks that don't match or the stains <laughs> <laughs> the coffee stains on the tie. Oh, uh, none it's of lovely. which you're guilty of, by the way. <laughs> no, no, but seriously, don't yeah. you think? Yeah. That it's it have, did you find that you had to develop it with time or oh, were you definitely. were you right into it or No, it took time. I, I it, my yeah. first reading I remember or second reading was at the second big reading was at the Edinburgh Festival many years ago in the mm-hmm maybe the early 90s, and uh, I was one of five poets in the poetry tent, mm-hmm. which was a small tent. Mm-hmm. And uh, just before the reading, I had to vomit. I was so nervous. Mm-hmm. So I went to find the, the <laughs> bathroom tent, which is right across the festival, and I finally found it, you know, puked. Uh, came out, washed my face, looked in the mirror and thought, what an amateur, you know. (laughs) And then heard somebody else puking. (laughs) And it was... It was Ben Okri. Oh, my God. <laughs> who had just won the Booker Prize. So I thought, uh, it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's all right. <laughs> Maybe it's even a good sign, really. Maybe. You, yeah, Maybe it yeah. makes you better. Yeah, it yeah. really does, yeah. yeah. Get rid of all the toxic stuff. <laughs> but, no, I mean, the reason I also... This is, the reason we're talking about this is also because we're talking about... When, when we talked about the Natisha, so it's about what treasures you can mine from the past and hybridity in terms of not just culture, but also genres. I mean, you're mm-hmm. a poet, you're a musician, you're a novelist, and sometimes these cross-pollinations between, between even genres sure. can be so rich. Yeah. But that brings me to 
language which both of you mm-hmm. I mean again leave me out of it language <laughs> <laughs> well visual language um. you know the great uh, okay <laughs> <laughs> uh, well you know they say in, in films is that if you can show it you don't have to talk about it and right. that's that's the uh, that's the great challenge and uh, and in fact i mean I, I i'd like to the biggest challenge that i faced with that was in in midnight's children because it was yes i can show it but i really miss salman rushdie's language because the, mm. when i think about what, one of the reasons i was attracted to the book is because of the language i mean sure. it's so it's so beautiful and and the way he when we going back to it the way he sort of for me personally he uh he reinvented english to make it my english yeah. mm. and that was such a in 1983 i mean i was walking around delhi and uh, and and was stunned by what i'd read which was midnight's children it and was the first time we had read a book first, exactly. in which we recognized the english, english we, yeah. uh, yes yeah. as our language as, as our language as as the one that as we, an indian language as an indian yeah. language he made yeah. english into an indian language yeah. and uh, so it really i really missed that because of course when we shot the film i mean a lot of it we we were showing it and uh, and it was in fact at the end of the film for those of you who've seen it and i know jeet has and uh, that uh, that i thought i said you know salman something is really missing and what what we're missing is the language so and you had the so voice i had the voice over yeah. that was at the end those well, are yeah. some of the Some most of the beautiful, beautiful lines in the book. In, in the book yeah. What I found most moving about the movie Midnight's Children was the way you showed the emergency. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because in the book, I mean, it's a masterpiece. And but in the book, the emergency doesn't jump out at you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, by then you you've been kind of want you've been amazed by so much you know mm-hmm. but in the movie the way you and i don't know how you did it it was something about the color and the mm-hmm, mm-hmm. just the look of it it reminded all of us that the emergency really was a a kind of a a turning point in indian history mm-hmm, mm-hmm, and it's something mm-hmm. that should never be forgotten you know and it's 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 interesting jeet and uh, uh, that how f- few people know about it yeah that's right you know it's yeah. it's quite uh, we really found out well because when midnight's children was sort of being distributed all over the world is that first of all people thought indira gandhi was generally uh, was mahatma gandhi's daughter yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly they had never heard about the emergency and as indians growing up in india and even it was it it's been it was it was a most you're right it was a pivotal point Absolutely. where all our values got questioned where democracy really was suspended and and we really realized how precious freedom of expression was and uh, so yeah, it was it was interesting but then again it was the colors you know we said uh, what did you do with the we, colors we took out all the color right you know, yeah. you know a time when when there's no freedom right. is colorless so it but it felt like something so obvious but we tried it and it i think it worked it absolutely yeah. worked in a very uh deep mm-hmm. in a core part of of the head yeah. mm-hmm. but uh, yeah, i felt that same way when i was i was reading narcopolis and we we were speaking about it yesterday uh it's just a stunning book it's stunning on many levels but uh, the inherent core for it that speaks to me to this day and i i read it about i think about 8 months ago and then once recently is uh, there's a there's a presence of 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 somebody that's not there so there are many and like you said there are many ghosts and there's uh, and so again it's it's that language how do you write and you did and you managed it how do you write something that doesn't exist and that language for me is is fascinating Did, because that voice is a very different voice than than doms or dimpies or or even you know all the characters well it's not uh, you know it, we had this conversation yesterday over dinner and uh, it uh, later when i thought about it i was thinking how much kind of ground we covered in kind of 10 minutes or something i know i you know it's not something i've often talked about about narcopolis but it is uh the the novel has everything to do with grief mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. with the loss of a uh, of a spouse and that's i think 
you know, it is the engine that drives the book. It is loss and grief. <laughs> you know? yeah. No, for sure, for sure. And this, this we covered uh, while eating Vikram's uh, 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 popsicles. <laughs> <coughs> Lamb popsicles. Lamb popsicles, which yeah. were just <laughs> to die for. <laughs> no, but uh, I, I, just, I also, it's, it's Narcopolis. I mean, there's, uh, there's a whole slew of, you know, uh, Indian English literature that has come out in the last few years. But it stands out. It's unique. And and I think that it ha, have you guys read it? You must, you you have to just pick it up and buy it like tomorrow or today or something, and <laughs> uh, because it is it's poetry, it really is. And also, if I think that what it did for me is that whether it's a film or whether it's a book or a drama or anything, that unless it opens what Huxley called the door of perception, it's worthless. And unless we learn something that something that's different, or we, we knew sort of existed, but didn't know how it existed in this particular place and time, and uh, you know, it, it, I think it, I, you know, I, I sort of question its validity. And what you did was open that door, which I, I did not know about this world. So if you, if you're into exploration, that's internal exploration. It is just superb. Thank you very much. That's true. I'm, I'm um, curious also, see, one of the things that hybrid souls, again, really struggle with is what's authentic. And we're mm. often accused of being inauthentic. I mean, of course, fusion is a dangerous thing. Sure. We all know that. Some music, I mean, should be banned. <laughs> um, but, we it, know, but we know that... Uh, that nothing should happen to Vikram and Sanjeev, right? No, no, Vikram and Sanjeev, God bless them. But well, you were uh, talking about fusion and confusion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, and it's a dangerous thing because you're, you, you're making a new language. You're bound to stumble and stutter. But, but authenticity is something we search mm -hmm. for. Authenticity is something that people kind of judge you by. What is authentic for us? And Deepa, you were saying earlier that when you when you did fire, and it, fire was in English, that mm -hmm. this whole question of authenticity, would they have spoken in English, comes up. And Jeet, you, a lot of people ask mm -hmm. you which language you write. And I face this as, as a writer, especially being in Canada or you know, um, any Anglos, in the Anglo-Saxon world. They're like, oh, you write in English. And it's mm -hmm. sort of trying to explain, you know, I don't even know where to start. But mm -hmm. maybe you mm -hmm. folks can. Well, you know, again, I'm going to disappoint you terribly, mm -hmm. but the only language I can read and write in mm -hmm. is English. Mm -hmm. you know? But what's and that? It's I don't nothing think that's, that's true. That's fabulous. And, and there, I don't think I'm very special, actually. There's lots of people <laughs> like me in India. And, you know, we, it's the only language we can read and write in. And, uh, you know, when you get this question, and this question especially comes up, uh, in Eng Indian poetry, much more than fiction for some strange reason. Mm -hmm. Poets really have it the hardest. You know? <laughs> They're the question of authenticity, as if to say that you cannot write poetry in any language other than the one your grandmother spoke. <laughs> but, you know, the point is my mother's tongue is not my mother tongue. My mother's tongue is Malayalam, my mother tongue is English. So for me to write in Malayalam is inauthentic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, you know, I would mm -hmm. have to learn it, I would have to fake it. Mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it just, and it just strikes me as a kind of an obsolete and I, Yeah, and also it's irrelevant, I feel. I, mean, mm -hmm. I think that there's a, a authenticity comes from, for me comes from character. And it, does, it yeah. comes from uh, honesty, and it comes from portrayal. It comes from a cadence, uh, which can be in English or Hindi or... Whatever, but you know, like like uh, like Jeet, you know, the language that I first learned was English, and uh, this was in Delhi. I mean, and uh, I, Punjabi I understand, Hindi I understand and speak really well. But uh, what you know, if somebody said, "What are your favorite four of, of even five uh, Hindi authors?" I mean, I could name three, you know, but not more than that. So, it uh, it just opens up your world. It opens up the options one one has, and uh, 
And uh, like I said, Salman really did us a favor. He really did. He, he really yeah. did us a huge but favor. But the thing is, he did us that favor in 1982. I know, I know. It's been a while. I know. <laughs> and, and we're still talking about it. It's all your fault, Sirish. <laughs> you brought it up. <laughs> Just kidding. No, no, but it's a fact. It's it still. Is. A, it's, it's still. It's, and, yeah. and like you were saying, this is a criticism, mm -hmm. strangely enough, that comes it, up only in India. India. It doesn't come up here or it doesn't come up in England or anywhere else, but the, uh, when fire was made, I mean, I was, we were just talking about it earlier, that uh, we, uh, we, it was in Delhi that uh, I got the most flack, right. that, you know, how can you make it in English? You know, these people would not be speaking in English, and uh, so it was interesting. And there yeah. was other flack for controversy, you know, with fire and with water. I know. I, I know this is boring, too. <laughs> but I, could we just address this briefly? Okay. Uh, I want, what I want to ask is, you know, you, you faced flack for fire and for water mm -hmm. for just absolutely irrelevant reasons, mm -hmm. but, and, of course, in India. And uh, I, you said that you loved satanic verses. Mm -hmm. And I, I, the question I would ask is, did you ever think of making satanic verses? And... If not, has it, would it have something to do with a kind of future knowledge that making a movie version of Satanic Verses would bring up a whole raft of accusations and criticisms that you'd just rather not deal with? Uh, I did think of uh, making Satanic Verses just because I think it's, uh, it's just, it would make a stunning, it would. Make a yeah. stunning film. A very <clears throat> long film, but a stunning film. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, and I don't think that I spoke to Salman about it, except he does know how much I really like it. And, uh, and the reason I didn't make it was that I felt, and this is, and this is what I mean about what controversy does to one. It, right. uh, I was being interviewed this morning, and uh, somebody said, and how do you feel about being controversial or something? And I said, that's one word that I really despise. Mm -hmm. I feel it, it limits my work. I feel I'm judged through the glasses of controversy. You know, we're talking mm -hmm. about even language and... and uh, and it's it's very demeaning. I feel I mean I feel really insulted, uh, because in a way, exactly what you just said, it limits sometimes what I really want to do. Because I know that if I had done satanic verses, I mean the combination of Salman and myself, it sort of was became lethal anyways. But uh, right. satanic verses and Deepa Mehta would have just done it. You know, so, so, so I don't know. I'm you know. Mm. I really, maybe I'm getting too old to deal with this and, you know, <laughs> somebody younger can do it. I don't have the energy. <laughs> but I, I just feel that it's a, it's a kind of uh, a tragedy in a way. Of course, it's very you know? tragic. Yeah. You're absolutely right, you know, because that kind of sort of self-limitation of self, I mean, that's what controversy does, is on some, on some level there is a bit of self-censorship, right. which is truly, I think... It's, it's a tragic, it's, it's, it's a tragic. And it's for non-artistic reasons. It, it, totally for non-artistic reasons. But, you know, if you've been around and you've, you've seen your effigy being burnt and you've seen your sets being bombed and, and you, you, know, you see the press, you know, having a field day yeah. about why you've sold your soul to the West, you know, it's like, what are you talking about, you know? And, <laughs> I mean, I was in India when the whole water thing hit the fan, you know, mm -hmm. and I don't think... People in Canada know quite how, actually, how vicious it was. Oh yeah, no, no, I don't think they do. Yeah, yeah. and you don't want to. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so we we never got to the music. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, I I started to uh, you know write poems and play music and uh, draw and read. In fact, uh, all around the same time at the age of 14. It was in the mid-70s in Hong Kong. I was living in Hong Kong. My father is an editor and a writer, and he started a magazine in Hong Kong called Asia Week. And uh, so I went to school in Hong Kong and uh, discovered drugs in the mid-70s, as you do, <laughs> you know. And it was all kind of tied in. And, you know, the thing about the drugs in the 70s, mm -hmm. they were intelligent drugs. Mm -hmm. They weren't the stupid drugs of the 90s and the 2000s, you yeah, know, the no, just true. mindless kind of yeah. uh, house drugs. And <laughs> <laughs> they, 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 were, they, they were mind expanding. They did kind of open your, 
your horizons and your, <laughs> the way you thought of the world and the universe and God and all those things. I don't mean to be an advocate for LSD, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it was tied in. It was a very fruitful, very, very kind of exciting, unpredictable time. Everything, politics, fashion, music, art, seemed to be tied, seemed to be exploding at the same time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I think it was uh, extremely uh, formative for, for many of us at mm-hmm, the time. And mm-hmm. of course, I had no idea how formative until much later. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, for many years, I wanted to be a musician, kind of full-time musician, and um, never made it. You know, I, I think I... Uh, and this is something I've discovered, too, about musicians and writers... Musicians are really treated very badly. You sleep on couches, mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. travel on buses, you're hardly paid. Writers, you know, we live fairly well. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm glad there, I have uh, an option. <laughs> glad you have a day job. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's the music. What were you studying in school? What did you... Oh, uh, the obvious... Yeah. Literature. I, I, I went back to India for a BA mm-hmm. uh, at, at Wilson College, part of Bombay University. Mm-hmm. And for, my, for the second year of that BA in literature, I was the only student in the English department. I had three professors. <laughs> one student. Are you serious? <laughs> Nobody else was foolish enough to do English literature. <laughs> <laughs> They're all doing economics and sociology and you know, useful things. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it made it difficult to cut classes. They know that. <laughs> <laughs> and then many years later, I did an MFA in uh, poetry in the U.S. in Sarah Lawrence College. And uh, it was an expensive degree. Uh, two years, poetry, MFA. And after that, with this kind of overqualification... I went into journalism, of all things. A uh, newspaper called India Abroad oh, yeah, yeah. in New York. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, well, if you don't know this newspaper, it's a, uh, it's a newspaper that su- has survived very well, in fact, mm-hmm. on matrimonial ads. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, horoscopes. <laughs> horoscopes. Horoscopes. And, <laughs> and immigration lawyers ads. <laughs> yes. And, <laughs> and in between the matrimonial ads and the immigration lawyers ads, there's some, you know, white space which has to be filled up by employees like me. <laughs> that was my job. <laughs> and then did you, uh, so were you writing poetry while you were uh, writing for India Abroad? Or? I was. Yeah. I, I had a slim book of poems in five years, which is about all I could manage with a full-time journalism job and a full-time job in drugs. You know, <laughs> That's also a full-time job. And, oh, yeah, yeah. and it wasn't until I quit drugs and quit working, which happened at the same time. Once I quit drugs, I realized I didn't need to work. <laughs> I, 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 didn't need to, I didn't need a salary. You know, I didn't need the... I didn't, money wasn't so urgent. You know, <laughs> so I could quit the job and become a full-time writer. So, uh, I, I moved in 2004. I quit uh, journalism, and mm-hmm. I moved from the U.S. to India and became a full-time writer. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, best best thing that happened. So one of the things that uh, I find that uh, you know, just reading Narcopolis and reading about you is that what always comes up is uh, you know the drug habit and giving it up. And do you find it easy talking about it, or do you find it like really boring now? How does it work? I no, I don't mind talking about it. I I uh, I'm still. Um, happy and grateful to be clean. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I never take it for granted. And mm-hmm. I know how difficult it was. Uh, it's been 10 years now. Mm-hmm. But I still remember how difficult it was the last time uh, that I quit to actually quit. You know, It took a year and a half on a methadone program. And I, I could never take it for granted. So uh, I, you know, I still wake up thinking I'm back in those days. So mm-hmm. I, I'm grateful and, you know, happy to be, to have survived it, as so many people mm-hmm. I know didn't. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. So it isn't a drag talking about it? No, or? not yet. Not yet, okay. <laughs> you let me know. Is it okay? <laughs> no, because it's, it's, it's the honesty 
of of the, of your approach is uh, is very uh, very moving to me. It's it's uh, especially in Narcopolis and how you you deal with it and talk about it. Well, last night because Lindsay's it isn't about mother, moral. Sorry, it's not about from a moral you know pedestal at all. It's just about yeah. matter of fact, and it's uh, it's an addiction, and addictions are difficult to get rid of. And I think the one thing that addiction teaches you is to never judge anyone. That's true. It's, yeah. it's something mm -hmm. William Burroughs said in one of his yeah, novels. Yeah. Wouldn't you? Yeah, true. Of course you would. Yeah. If it was you, you'd do all of that stuff. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how could I possibly judge mm -hmm. anyone? You know? And so to uh, have a character in a novel who is a, a eunuch, uh, has been a prostitute, is a, uh, an addict, and then starts to educate herself by reading books, uh, you know, is considered the low, all those characters considered lowest of the low, you know. Oh yeah, yeah. It, and some of them are really scary. Yeah. Certainly, one of them yeah, is. Yeah, scary. one of them really is very <laughs> scary. Yeah. So yeah, it uh, made sense somehow. Hmm. Interesting. What were you saying about Lindsay's mother? She's a fine woman. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yes. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, she. She. <laughs> she is a fine woman. She said. Uh, she said last night. You know, I heard that interview on uh, CBC, uh, the Eleanor Wachtel interview, and she said I was just uh, uh, surprised at the kind of things you said. And I wondered if someone interviewed me, would I be able to be to keep their attention for uh, whatever length of time? And I said, well, if you were to be completely frank, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and when you were asked a question, and not keep anything. Uh, hidden, I think you would mm -hmm. be. A, I think anybody would. Anybody you know? can. You're absolutely right. Yeah. There yeah. is something about honesty that's completely liberating because you don't have to keep track of what you shouldn't have said or what's not true. Mm. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that works. You don't have to keep track of the false truths I know, and yeah, the half truths. And the half truths because those, that's very time consuming. It is. <laughs> 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 hmm. Well, I mean, since we're in Vancouver, there's a particular history here. I, uh, well, let's go back. I think that some of the cross-pollination that we've experienced, say, some of the issues with language, with English, we have to, you know, admit colonization and mm -hmm. empire was, was a huge chunk of, of that. And here in Vancouver, not that long ago, there was the Kumagata Maru incident um, you know, and, and here we are in, a, in what seems to be, a, a, and it is, a, a much more easily hybrid, you know, uh, mixed society. But you were going to make a film on, on the Kumala. I, I still am. It's just, oh. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes, okay. I'll definitely do it. I just yeah. think that, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, I was feeling the intense pressure of doing it before the anniversary next year. Mm. And I, I started to feel uncomfortable about it because I think it's such a huge topic. And it's, uh, I was telling the story to Jeet yesterday and he said, my God, it's a natural. Mm. And it is. It's, it's, it's about race. It's about, uh, you know, about politics. It's about... Uh, and I, my name for the film is actually Exclusion because that's what it was. It was about exclusion. And uh, I've written the script and... Mm. Uh, I wanted to take my time with the casting and to do it right and to you know to be able to not rely on digital um, you know manufacture of the boat and people and uh, like to do it authentically and that would that takes a bit of time and mm. so I said let me take a couple of years do something else while uh, the producers looking for the right you know right time and then. No, to good. do it I'm properly. Glad, I'm glad no, no, you're I, working no, on it. I love it. No, it's, it's and you have a script written. I have a written yeah. script, yeah. 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 I haven't cast it as yet. Okay. <laughs> well, only a matter of time. Only a matter of time. And no, no. Uh, some of the details in the story you were saying, it just struck me that you couldn't make that stuff up. No, <laughs> no it's, 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 you know, it's the whole thing about fiction, you know. Yeah, exactly. In fact, yeah, it's, it's stunning and it's a very moving story. Mm -hmm. I think that that's what really gets me. It's, it's moving, it's inspiring, uh, it's depressing, yeah. but it's uh, like all, everything that's historical, it, it, it opens again another window of perception. Yeah. And it, although it's of a very specific time period, 
it's timeless in a way. It's Absolutely. As relevant today as it ever was. You know, and there was something that um, I, I don't know if I, uh, Bunuel, who's uh, my one of my favorite directors, uh, Spanish directors of all time, said that uh, the minute you're specific is the very minute you become universal and timeless. Right. And uh, and I think that this is such a specific story, and and I think if you if you stick to that specific whatever, <laughs> uh, uh, then you how then, many C's? Yeah, I know the specific and, uh, city. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> that's why he's the writer, right? Uh, is that you can capture that uh, you know that that scope, that universal and timeless scope of it. Yeah. I mean, I, I, it was, I mean, I'm thinking aloud here, just you know, because you put me here. And, <laughs> um, but thinking about the diaspora, and diaspora, I mean, of course, comes from spore. From it's a very botanical reference. And I was thinking, for a lot of us, the way we've moved around the world is very botanical. I mean, the bloody Brits picked us up from somewhere, scattered us, uprooted <laughs> us, <laughs> seeds, scattered us, planted us somewhere, often to work on plantations. <laughs> so, I mean, there's, there's a very botanical thing going on mm -hmm. around here. And then, and then we're, but Jeet, I was wondering, like, it, I've always, it's bothered me, and I've always wondered, and like you said about Salman Rushdie, in 82, he invented a new language, it's been a while. And I'm thinking empire, it's been a while. Um, apart from Joseph Conrad, has anyone really engaged with empire and fiction and poetry? I mean, do you, I, I, I can't think of, and I can't think of anything. Well, you know. Naipaul has done it in a, mm -hmm. in a kind of a reverse way in some ways. <laughs> <laughs> he's, uh, <laughs> you know, he's done it sort of from their side, you know, in a mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. And, um, but of course, inhabited completely from a, a kind of doubly displaced Indian. And I think that's the kind of, that's the narrative that you find in every single book by Naipaul. And mm -hmm. it's something, that's his wound, you know. And I think it's the enigma of arrival. Yeah. I mean, that yeah. says it all. It, it all, exactly. That, that's, yeah, yeah. In fact, that's his true that's his autobiography. That's as true as I think so. Yeah. I really do. I think that that is his autobiography. And, and it's, it's and supposed it's, to be a novel. But, but it's not. It's, it's not. not. Yeah. And it is an, an open wound. It is. And, like, and it's a wound that will never heal, yeah. you know. And it's a wound that you, you think about, about this 18-year-old vegetarian Brahmin. From Trinidad. From huh? Trinidad, yeah. taking a ship to London, sitting in his hotel room and having to eat above a waste paper basket because he doesn't want to get any of the crumbs on the floor. And then uh, going to school and uh, writing a book and no publisher picks it up and genuinely thinking about suicide for two years. You know, and then of course this 18-year-old from Trinidad is transformed into a perfect Englishman. Brown Sahib, yeah, he be, he was the ultimate Brown Sahib, wasn't he? Yeah. yeah. From his accent to yeah, yeah. to his cottage in Wiltshire, you know. Yeah. It's a it's a kind of a parable. Yeah, in it many is. Ways, you know, <coughs> I mean, it's uh, it tells us that that the idea of colonialization and empire is never going to go away, you know. And it's mm -hmm. not even something that's going to disappear uh, in the next generation. It stays in names, in place names, in people's names. It stays in the kind of fervor with which we fight those names. Mm -hmm. You know, no, totally. changing Bombay to Mumbai and the kind of constant war that that entails. I know, Chennai. You know. Chennai. And Chennai. Chivandrum to Thiruvananthapuram. Uh, impossible. You know. Impossible. Yeah. 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 Bangalore to Bengal? Bengaluru. Bengaluru or Bengaluru. something like that. Uh, Why would you want Bengal in a name for a city in Karnataka? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, well, you know, it's like us and our, you know, the queen on our currency. You know, like, that's also a colonial hang-up. You know, sooner than later than... You know, I'd, I'd like Trudeau to be there, personally. Yeah. <laughs> I was thinking of our currency has the Queen's, the Canadian yeah. currency has the Queen's picture on it. You know, so this still does. It still does. Yeah. I mean, and this is, and we really have very strong monarchists in this country. Uh, luck, you know, luckily we're just sort of going away from it. But uh, that for many Canadians is, uh, is heritage of Canada. I mean, right. the poor, you know, 
uh, First Nation <laughs> just forgotten completely. It's a real tragedy. Yeah. Well, you know, the idea of the UK and the Commonwealth, mm -hmm. that's, we still use those words. Mm -hmm. Commonwealth, yes. Common that would be nice, yeah. Commonwealth. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> Bring it on. We can take it. <laughs> you know what? Give us our me, baby. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so, I mean, do you, is there, do you have a question, a few questions left for each other? Or shall we ask Jeet to read poetry? Oh, I, I, poetry? you know, you, he was amazing last yeah. night. We have to share that. Come on, Jeet. No, in fact, in fact, Jeet, I mean, last night in the middle of a dinner, Jeet stood up and delivered the set of beautiful poems. Uh, what are they? The how to become? How to, how, how to, how to be? How, how to, to be, be. The how yeah. to be poems. And I thought of that. That's one kind of hybridity. And mm -hmm. please, I know you'll kill me for this, but please repeat verbatim. <laughs> because that was so beautiful, you must do it exactly as you did last well, night. Well, how many... <laughs> I apologize in advance if there were many of you who were there last night. And, you know, yeah. Nothing to apologize for. Check. Well, the good thing about these poems are, is that uh, they are very short. <laughs> you don't have to steal yourself for an epic. Uh, they are uh, entries. They're not even poems. They're entries in a kind of a how-to guide, a... a a self-help manual. And they tell you how to be various creatures. The first one tells you how to be a toad. This one is useful for actors and actresses, if there are any in the audience. You know, actors think about beauty a lot. <laughs> how to be a toad. Take three spores with a dram of rum. Hold it on your tongue for longish moments. Pack all thoughts of gold in a small leather case the size of a sapphire. Tell yourself repeatedly, I will never again be beautiful. How to be a leaf. Hold your breath until you are God's green thoughts. Stop eating. The air will suffice for food. Water is another matter. The skin absorbs nutrients. The eyes adjust. The limbs grow inward. Conjugate patience. Worship women and trees. Mm -hmm. That's a feminist one. <laughs> How to be a horse. Know the nostril. All power gathers there. Inflate yours until the blood rings. It will take all your training to be horse, not ass. <laughs> <laughs> this is a thin crossing, perilous to the absent-minded and the estranged of heart. Avoid all latitudes. <laughs> latitudes, because the horse latitudes is where, you know, the Spanish galleons, when they were yeah. stuck without without a breeze, the first things that went overboard were the, the stallions, the horses. How to be a crow. Oh, by the way, last night I forgot some crucial lines from this poem, oh. which is what happens when you're saying things from memory, so <laughs> make up for that today. How to be a crow. Learn to name the animals one by one. Stinking, babbling, breedy, querulous, maddened jet. Mm. Usurp the duties of God. Why not? After all, this is what poets do. <laughs> As for crow, kill color, turn black, not nigger black. Mm. It's beautiful. Really. And finally, how to be a bandicoot, which is a, a, a large 
Bombay rat, <laughs> uh, kind of a Shiv Sena rat. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, a, a rat that's impossible to kill. You can't drown these rats because they know how to swim. You cannot poison them. They like poison. They have it for breakfast. You know, they have it on their toast for breakfast. They, uh, you can't uh, drop them from a tall building because they bounce and scamper away. You could try to shoot them with a large bore rifle, but even that is no guarantee that uh, they won't come back. <laughs> How to be a bandicoot. Assume dominance over the underworld. Your enemies are legion. Eat them. <laughs> Eat everything. You must build your strength. A crash will surely come. Your eyes are red legends. Your name is Adam. <laughs> wow. Thank you very much. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. So I think we should turn the mics over for questions, and I know that Margaret in the front row has a burning question. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to give the first question to you. <laughs> I got to ask all those questions of Jeet mm -hmm. yesterday. So I guess I'm looking around the room and seeing that we are increasingly in places where people are from many different, come from different places, are having babies with people from different places. So what does that mean for cultural hybridity? What does that mean in terms of retaining one's culture and and becoming something new? And how, how much do you hold on to the threads? Me? Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, they, people, people say that that's sort of going to be the last uh, bastion when, when babies, when there's cross marriages and, uh, and those lines get blurred. And perhaps it would, it would be a good thing because then we'll just hold on to whatever part of the culture that we want to, and that works for us, and that isn't thrust upon us. I, I personally like the idea of choice more than anything else in the world, because that means a certain kind of freedom. Maybe it'll be a more peaceful world. And again, I think it also is a way of making, uh, making us less judgmental mm -hmm. uh, and less uh, kind of um, you know, narrow. It just widens, uh, widens your, your uh, opinions and your view of yourself in the world in a way that can only help and help others and help your interaction with others. And I can't help but see it as a kind of a, a very positive... No, for sure. It is a something... A hopeful that, sign for the future. And, uh, can you imagine? I mean, nobody... Then there'll be no judgment about color. I mean, yeah. that's huge. Yeah. And then preconceptions, because that's what kills us too. You're Indian, so you must love curry, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, whatever, you know. It's it's uh, it's it's. I think for me, that's that's what's uh, really sometimes irritating. Uh, I, one of my great st stories was when I first came to, uh, flew into Canada. Uh, I was taken. Uh, my husband, and myself, who is from Canada. And his wife, uh, he's my ex-husband now, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> that's just, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, we were taken to a, to a ball game. I'd never been to a ball game in my life. And, uh, and of course, had dressed inappropriately for it and worn a sari. So that was a bit absurd. Uh, <laughs> but we got there, and there was, you know, the gentleman was a really extremely learned and intelligent man, in fact, was... Uh, John Bassett, who was the senior, who was the owner of CTV and stuff, and and we, you know, we had a rather, a con rather heated and passionate conversation about something, and then he said, uh, he stopped in the middle and he said, "You speak really good English," uh, and and he said, uh, and I said, "Thank you," and he said, "And where did you learn?" And I said, "On the plane coming over." <laughs> <laughs> so he said. Yeah. He was very impressed. <laughs> so we're talking about language and stuff, you know. It's, it's a, a long flight. <laughs> it's a long, that's exactly, 17 hours, yeah. <laughs> you know. 
<laughs> he had no idea who he was dealing with. <laughs> <know. laughs> it was funny. <laughs> uh, about, uh, I, I always also think of something the great Indian poet A.K. Ramanujan said. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, he was teaching uh, at the University of Chicago for many years, I think for decades. He was one of the early recipients of the MacArthur Award, mm-hmm. the Genius Award, and he translated these folk st- tales from all over India into English, into beautiful English. And he wrote beautiful poems in English, as well as translations from Kannada and uh, Tamil of very early po- poetry. So when somebody asked him, uh, you know, they were just inventing the phrases Indian American mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, Indian, Canadian, and American Indian, all these phrases were just being invented. They asked him what he thought of Indian American, and he said in that phrase, Indian American, he located himself in the hyphen. Ah, that's, oh, that's, can I say that I said it? (laughs) 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 It's it's really, how wonderful. It's because it gets too tiring to be, are you this, are you that? And what does it mean if you're an Indian? I, it's obvious I'm in, you know, I'm and Indian. I'm very proud. Choose? And why should I choose? And it's obvious to me that I'm Canadian because, uh, you know, uh, gee, uh, I've, I've said this very often, you know, people said, are you Canadian? Are you Indian? Is, are your films Indian? Are they Canadian? And I say, you know, if, if, it's, if India inspires me with its stories, Canada gives me the freedom to express those stories. So for me, both are equally important, and I cannot do one without the other. And why should I be one or the other? When I love them both, it sounds... Well, I love them sometimes, but... (laughs) (laughs) But I do. It's a gentleman there in the blue T-shirt. That's beautiful. Yes, um, (gasps) thank you. Uh, I just wanted to kind of continue that vein, because I feel for myself... um, Hybridity is not a steady state. It is like water sloshing in a bowl. You kind of mm-hmm. go back and forth between you know, various poles. And for me, I have uh, an Indian stepfather, an Indonesian father, uh, a mother that has Aboriginal heritage. And so it's a very confusing world. And mm-hmm. I see how easy for you today um, it is to talk about hybridity. And yet, for both of you, your work is very much about some of the things that rub you raw around it. And I kind of wanted to know a little bit more. Can you tell me how the notion of hybridity does rub you raw at times. I think, in fact, Deepa just addressed that. I just that. said it. You and, know, you know, the whole the idea of... Preconception. Then. Oh, and, and the idea of wanting to tell stories set in about one place and not being able to even shoot those stories in, yeah. in you India. Can't, I couldn't do them. Yeah. You know, the stories that I have told in my films, I mean, I couldn't shoot water in India, for You example. had to do it in Sri Lanka. I had to do it in Sri Lanka. So, you know... So you, you have that, you get inspired by a few stories, but to express them sometimes you have to actually be quite inventive. And that's good. It really is good. I think that uh, water was stopped in the year 2000 when we were shooting it in Varanasi in India by Hindu fundamentalists who said it was anti-Hindu for some reason. And, uh, you know, the sets were bombed. It was really awful. And I didn't shoot the film for seven years after that. It took me seven years to get over that absolute feeling of anger. And, you know, anger is a very strong emotion, but it's not a very clean lens. Hmm. And I knew that if I ever had to do a film that I really cared about, a script that I really cared about, I couldn't do it till I was angry. And it took Hmm. me about seven years to get over that anger. So, but I think that shooting it in Sri Lanka really helped it because I didn't have the, the weight of what was expected from me. So you learn to be inventive. And I, that's the good thing about it. So use it. Don't be confused by it. Just embrace it, I think. And I think that's what I've done. I've, be, I've become, I just am who I am, and it doesn't make too, and I don't get into definitions. They really irritate me and confuse me. So I just am myself. <laughs> it's true. And absolutely, that's, a, that's, Hybridity rubbing raw. That's, yeah, exactly. That's the wrong, you know. Um, Okay. Uh, I was interested in what uh, Jeet was uh, saying about uh, Ramanujan and about 
Indian poetry uh, in English. And uh, I'm wondering, you know, the, the only Indian poets writing in English that are familiar to most people are people like uh, Don Marais or Vikram Seth or Sujata Bhatt or uh, Imtiaz Dhaka, who have lived abroad and been published abroad. Uh, is it something to do with the Indian publishing scene, or is it the, uh, the scene in the rest of the Anglo-Saxon world that deprives us, even for instance of your book, uh, 60 Indian Poets, which would, would be very useful for people to have. Uh, why is it that we don't, we, we can't access so many books of the vast number of really good poets writing in English from India? You know, the name that I would like to give you is Lawrence Battleman. He's a poet, great Indian poet that nobody knows about, who died in Vancouver. Uh, mm. he, in fact, there's a, a housing estate named after him, uh, the Lawrence Battleman, Battleman Estate. And he was working in public housing for a while and uh, died early of alcoholism, as poets do. <laughs> uh, you know, and uh, when he was very young, he published, I think, uh, five books in India. Uh, with Writer's Workshop and astonishing poems mm. for a 20-year-old poet. And, uh, but nothing came out of them. He made no money. He got no teaching offers. He, it was absolutely desolate, you know. Mm -hmm. So he left it all and came to Canada and never wrote. I think, oh, he had also written plays. Mm -hmm. But he didn't see a future in it. A great poet came to Canada worked in public housing, drank himself to death. And uh, what somebody should do is publish a collection of Lawrence Bantleman. Absolutely. Yeah. Canada Council can, I'm sure, help and, with that. That's amazing. And in fact, he's one of you know, five names I could think of oh, wow. you know, that hmm. have been forgotten and really shouldn't have been. And uh, they are in that have... anthology. They're also, there's a larger version of, a, of that anthology called the Blood Axe Book of contemporary Indian poets, which is 72 poets. Uh, but again, you know, you can't really find that easily. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we have time for two more questions. There was one with the mic already back there, question. and Vancouver. one yeah. right in the front row here. In the front row, yeah. Hi, Deepa and Jeet. Um, thank you for sharing your stories and experiences tonight. Um, I'm here. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, really relates to what you just shared, Jit, and also relates to um, your experiences with shooting um, Water Deepa around the trauma, transnational trauma, and like com really relates to um, Natya Sastra as well, the importance of emotions, colonization, empire. My question would be, what does art, different forms of art, po uh, poet, uh, poems, um, dance, um, music, um, movies, how does this trouble um, theories, critical concepts like colonization, um, um, different um, constructs of power? For example, I'm pretty sure many of us here know Shani Mutu's work and like how, how critical she is in addressing uh, transcolonial traumas. Mm -hmm. What do you think? How can um, artists, different forms of art, can engage with this kind of theories and really trouble the waters, especially because you're you're looking for it. Uh, you're looking to. Um, I, I think the question is understood. No? Your yeah. next movie, so yeah, we'd love to know more about that. I, just before Deepa gets into this, I just want to say that if you're an artist and you think of phrases like transcultural, I know I don't even know what it means. And yeah. theorizing and all of that, you're not going to make anything. You know, you'll just be so overwhelmed by the concepts of yeah. it that you won't, you, you know. So, yeah, I think uh, some things it's better for teachers and academics, yeah. academics to talk about yeah. and not... But, not, yeah, no, no, totally. I mean, and I, and I think, I mean, it's not that it's... What you're saying is valid, but I'm saying it's a different language and it's a different discipline. And I, and if... I'm sure, I mean, I think that uh, 
some of our work is political, and I think art in some form or the other is always political, and it should be political. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think it's self-consciously so. I don't feel that I, I, I have to address uh, trans... Uh, what, what cultural trauma. Cultural, yeah, trauma. Because mm. I, but what I can do is talk about something that moves me on a personal basis. And then what art does, or film does, I think, to, to some extent is... Uh, is to make what you're talking about accessible on a, in, on, on a simpler level. And then if you want to look at, say, what happens with exclusion or what happens with, uh, uh, with fire or water, you can always go to the library or Google it and, and get into it you know, later. But it's the first step. I, I don't look at it as an acad my work as an academic work. It's, it's purely artistic. I don't know. How would and you feel? And that's how it should be. And that's you know. how it should be, yeah. The last question, please. Um, speaking of, a writer, of writers uh, addressing colonialism, uh, Chinua Achebe comes to mind. Um, also speaking as someone who is not hybridized in any way but is married to someone who is, one of the things that's really striking to me is how... Uh, colonialism and hybridization are, are two sides of a coin. It's interesting that we're talking about, about it tonight and how important amnesia is to the dominant culture. And what's striking to me with my husband's family, um, in particular his father who is 90 years old and has been in Canada for um, uh, almost 85 of those years, uh, and how he bristles at Indo-Canadian, at the hybridization. He really bristles. But what's really uh, apparent to me, coming from a completely different cultural background, is the hybridization is not only uh, transnational, it's also through time that the uh, people on my husband's side of the family are so much more connected to the past, so much, and the family roots have we are amputated, amputees and amnesiacs, the white Canadians, I think, in some ways. We don't relate to families in Europe the way that um, our, my husband's family, for instance, still relates to the families in India. So it's that passage through time. And what's striking to me is how much more connected the, the hybrid, so-called, uh, is relative to... Uh, a fairly dominant and fairly provincial dominant culture. Comment? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I think the, the fact of being displaced from a culture into another, uh, it, it just makes something more vi visibly obvious that's actually happening to everybody. You don't have to have moved to another country or another city to feel displaced. <laughs> You could have lived in one city, on one street in one city your whole life and True. feel completely displaced because everything around you has changed so much. For instance, Kiefer Street in Vancouver. I'm sure in the last 20 or 30 years, it's been unrecognizable the kind of changes that have occurred around it and will continue to occur. So hybridization, displacement, it's just really a modern it's a, a condition. It's a human condition. It's the human condition. And it's and always been there. It's I, always, it's been, always there. been there. And I don't think that it belongs to uh, people who have just migrated. And I think that that would be looking at it very narrowly. I think, actually, Canadians really know about it. In a, in a different way, perhaps, with a different lens. But people, who, people being people, we all know what it means being displaced, leaving your leaving your family home to, to live across, even across the street. When you leave your family home, when you go to university, you're being displaced. We all know what it's like because being displaced in my mind, and one of the reasons I love doing uh, Midnight's Children was that the, I, for me, the book is all about seeking home, identity, new families. And we all know about it. We don't have to be colored to know what, what it means. Yeah, absolutely. And it depends whether you're the conqueror, the prospector, or the laborer when you move. 
And I think that makes such a huge yeah, difference. Yeah, of course it does. Yeah. So, uh, really, thank you so much. Thank you, Suresh. You did very well. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.